So hi everyone. Um, I'm here mostly with PR, TR, uh, Alicia, and Susan, really Alicia, who's done the uh, heavy lifting for this project. Um, and what I want to do is just say a few things about what we are doing sort of in, a, in the bigger picture of what the things that are doing and why we are doing. Um, and then uh, there are several trends of research that are happening under this umbrella of carbon targets uh, and the risk that might be conveyed through carbon targets and whether or not a company achieves it. Um, and today we are focusing on the modeling aspect about how we might be able to quantify this risk in a video uh, model, in a critical model. So fact number one is that more and more corporations uh, and national institutions even are reporting carbon targets of various times in the future. As public interest uh, and policymakers uh, begin focusing on this, this has become a really important issue. So, but not all targets that are announced are met. So our question is, is there something that is that might convey to particularly to investors about a company's uh, ability to make these targets? And, and how can we infer that uh, from the data that's observed at uh, either historically all about the company's plans as they've announced. So we're trying to be predictive of whether a company would meet, uh, meet a target or not. So uh, that's the overall project. Uh, there are a number of people working on this, Susan, Alicia, and myself. There are several others who've been advising it. The research project with large uh, has is funded uh, as, uh, by uh, John Shaw and Calvert. Uh, the uh, ratio of funding is invaluable and without that this project couldn't happen. So thank you, John and everyone at Calvert. So why are we interested in this? The, the carbon targets are not homogeneous. And some of these targets are voluntary targets that companies announce for the future. They come up with it, perhaps sometimes based on what they can achieve, sometimes based on pressure imposed by uh, various international organizations and policymakers who might say, well, these are the targets that are needed for a company uh, for the world to meet these global standards that, uh, that we are all aspiring. Uh, and, so the, so the, and others are not voluntary, they're mandatory. They're driven by either a uh, national policy or in some cases, a local regulatory policy that might talk about how a particular company or an industry, what their emissions can be. So there are compliance-based mandatory targets and there are voluntary targets. And what we find is that that might in fact be one of the driving forces, not surprisingly, about whether or not a company meets these targets. So we, we as we build the model, that's one of the issues that come up. Now, why are financial institutions and investors interested? Because if they, if a company doesn't meet a target, then there might be financially material ramifications, either through fines or penalties that might be attached there. So not meeting a target is a financial risk to both equity investors and the holders of the company. Um, but it doesn't have to be necessarily existing uh, regulations or compliance needs. It could be future regulations that might come into play since we're talking about future targets. And uh, with the, what the company is doing about these targets conveys their ability to meet these future targets. So that, uh, that, as, that also reflects uh, uh, a certain risk uh, element that needs to be incorporated into valuation models. But even if there weren't regulations, there are reputational effects that consumers might be interested in. So that also impacts the valuation of firms. So there are a variety of reasons why all of these standards are important and whether or not they really uh, needs to be taken into account. Be taken into account. Now, we in this data, in this project, has two strands of work, as I mentioned before. One of them is to create a database that includes 
a variety of existing data sources, but embellish it and augment it with some new data sources that really are more forward looking plans that companies have made that they've announced, uh, incentives that they're giving to management, uh, and other such uh, uh, information pieces and information about actions that a corporation might be taking. Now that led us to the cho choice of this particular uh, industry uh, that we want to focus on today, which is the electric utility industry, where in fact such plans are well articulated and documented so we've actually, in our database creation, we've gone and gathered that stuff as well. So here's a list of the kinds of data that we've, we've collected to do that. But today, what Alicia is gonna talk about is how do we take this data and begin to build a model? And the model looks at the, the historical period, 10 years of data for 15 electric utilities that have many more targets, even though it's only 15 companies, and we look at these variables and see how these, can we get a, a model that fits the data uh, to understand uh, whether, whether the company's ability to make these targets is, is explained by this data. So to put it in perspective, last year we presented some very preliminary results with this data for three utilities. And we came up with these kinds of likelihood estimates which are really subjective estimates based on what we saw uh, from the data. Today, we're gonna to take this and formalize this in a model. And that's a somewhat of a heroic task. So we've made some progress so in that sense, this is not completed work and we're looking for your comments uh, to take it forward. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Alicia, you can take it. So some of you may remember bits and pieces of this project that we presented at uh, prior IMAP events, where we looked at three case studies of utility companies, PG&E, P&M, and Eversource. And from that initial examination, we were able to glean some information that might inform us in the second stage of our research where we're kind of creating this predictive model. So I'm just gonna briefly um, talk about one of the case studies, P&M, uh, to talk about, about what we did in that preliminary analysis. So here we mapped or had a visual representation of PNM's past performance. So we had this red line, which is the historic emission levels. And then we have these color bars to the right for the years 2015 and 2020. These color bars represent its targets. And you probably notice that there are multiple bars in the same year. This actually represents the same targets. So PNM is subject to renewable portfolio standards or RPS targets which require the utility to supply a certain percentage of its electricity from eligible renewable sources. But as you might notice on our left-hand side of the graph, we use the absolute emission levels in million metric tons. And so we had to convert that percentage into absolute emissions. And to do that, we needed some information about its predicted load size or its demand size. That we found in the utility's integrated resource plant or IRPs. And so each of these color bars just represents the absolute emissions of that RPS target based on the information that was available in that RP, or IRP. So for example, the green bar above 2015 represents the RPS target um, based on the predicted load size from the 2011 IRP. And then the blue bar represents the RPS target in absolute emissions based on the 2014 IRP. Um, so as we can see, uh, PNM misses its target in 2015, but was able to achieve it in 2020. And so one of the things that we did in this initial examination was to try to understand why a utility achieved or missed its targets. So when we dive back into the IRPs, um, and integrated resource plans, uh, for those who don't know, are basically these kind of five to 10 year investment plans that utilities have to file with their respective Department of Public Utilities or DPU. So when we looked at these uh, documents, um, we kind of came up with the story that PNM had reported that it was uh, thinking about retiring two units of its coal-based San Juan generating stations. And if it was able to do so, it would actually meet its 2015 targets. However, it decides not to do so because they deem it to be too expensive. So there is something in the New Mexico legislation, um, which is the state that PNM operates in, 
which says that if a utility finds it too expensive to close a fossil fuel plant, that they don't have to, they don't have to meet this target um, and they won't be penalized for it. And they cite that this is a way to protect, protect consumer rates, but in, the, in essence, it's a loophole for utilities not to meet its target without being penalized for it. So this is what PNM cites for 2015, but in 2016, 2017, they finally decide that yes, it is economically feasible to close these two units. And so they do in 2017, and that puts them on track to meet that 2020 target. Um, another thing I wanna point out was that from this one graph, we were able to glean 25 data points uh, which we use in the second stage of our, uh, the second stage of this research in terms of creating the, the predictive model. You might wonder where we got those 25 data points. So each of these data points represents a snapshot in time. So for example, if you were in 2011 and that point right above the word historic, you're standing in 2011 and you know that you have a target in 2015 because the target has been established by then. And you have all this data that's available to you at that time. All that data we capture for that year 2011. And so that's one data point. And then if you jump over to 2012, that's another snapshot in time. We collect the data that was available in that point of time and so on. And we did that for each of the targets, the original and the revised targets. Um, and so that's how we, we kind of got 25 data points. Um, so the next thing we did is look at PNM's future performance. Um, so again, we have the red historic mission lines and then all these targets from 2023 20, until it's net zero goal in 2040. Um, if we were taking another snapshot on time where you're standing in 2020 and you just have solely the historic emissions data, you might think, well, we're not gonna meet the next target in 2023. The uh, reduction, amount of reduction in carbon emissions is just so drastic. And if you did something like retire those two units of San Juan, we might not make it. Um, however, if we take another look into its integrated resource plans, we see that PNM outlines its planned actions in order to meet not only its 2023 targets, but all its targets up until 2040. And then based on its planned actions, and the closure of these fossil fuel based generation assets, we can kind of estimate what these closures would mean in terms of its emissions. And it would mean that PNM would actually be on track to meet these uh, targets, which is pretty surprising if we only look at the historic data. Um, however, we're not virtually certain that PNM is going to meet these targets, even if these closures have been approved by the respective public Department of Public Utilities up until at least 2030. And this is because there are, is some uncertainty. One is that they've used the reasonable cost threshold in the past to miss their targets, and they might use that again if it turns out that closing these uh, assets are too expensive. And two, we're not completely sure of how PNM is going to replace the energy that was generated from these fossil-based assets. And so uh, previously, we kind of attached this likely um, kind of score to PNM, but we're hoping to move um, beyond this very uh, kind of visual examination to something more quantitative. Um, but from this preliminary examination, we kind of came to this insight that historic emissions are simply not enough, not enough information to predict whether a utility is going to meet its future carbon targets. And there are other information, other variables that we need to consider. And that's how we moved into the second stage of our research. So what are the variables that we're considering? Well, we kind of um, categorize the, these kind of variables into, two, into three things. The first of which is difficulty. Um, how long until a target deadline? How many years do you have until you have to achieve this target, which we classify as time to target in years? Then we have how much carbon needs to be reduced in order to meet the target? which is carbon reduction in its percentage form. And this is just to um, take into account the different sizes and demands of the different utilities. How aggressive is the target? Which is another way to say what's the speed of the target, which is just the reduction divided by the number of years. Now, the second theme is incentives. So are there any managerial incentives, which means are there any financial um, compensations given to the executives? And that's coded as Either one, they exist, or two, they, or zero, they don't exist. Is the target mandatory or voluntary? And does it have any penalties, which we call target type? 
this is where it gets a little bit complicated. So initially we uh, classify the targets into these five different buckets where we have um, voluntary targets, which are set by the company itself. We have the RPS targets as coded as two or three, depending if they have penalties or don't have penalties. And then we also have these GHG emission targets with or without penalties again. Um, but given the size of our data sets and um, there wasn't as much variation as we hoped to just because Utilities historically haven't set a lot of targets in the period that we're looking at from 2010 to 2020, but with the future data set from 2020 up until 2050, there's a whole bunch of targets um, that vary across different categories. We did compress uh, these uh, targets into two categories, a zero that there were non-binding targets, they didn't have any penalties, and the one that they did have penalties but we're hoping to potentially expand this with a beta, bigger data set into these different, five different categories. Um, the third theme is ability of the company to meet its target. Uh, what are the company's intended actions, which are the stated plan actions that we saw with PNM? Um, and this we also categorize into four buckets. Um, it's coded as one if the plans are very vague, Two, if the reductions are mainly in business operations or in the distribution trans transmission component of the business. And then three and four are related to the elimination or the retirement of fossil fuel based generation assets. And then how they replace that energy either through the procurement of more renewable energy just from the market or purchasing recs or actually investing in, in new assets. And lastly, is the company financially capable to meet its targets? And we evaluate that in two ways with its debt ratio and its credit rating. Of course, there are many entities that spit out credit ratings um, and there are many different levels of credit ratings, but we decide just to use two buckets, whether it's investment grade or non-investment grade. Um, so we ended up looking at 50 utilities that give a good variation across these variables. Um, and from these 15 utilities, we gleaned 98 uh, targets with 551 checkpoints. Um, so this is kind of a, a small snapshot of what our data set looks like. Um, so on the left-hand column, we have a target these animations um, where we have the, the year the target was established and then the year, um, the deadline year, which is 2015, the first example. Then we have all of these uh, variables that we have mentioned before. As you might notice, there are, is a combination of continuous variables and then binary or categorical variables. Um, this kind of gets to, I think, Eddie's point earlier. Um, we've also were uh, made sure that with RPS targets, which are, um, I guess, associated with the state and the service within the state, we did recognize that there are utilities that um, operate in multiple states. And so with these RPS targets, um, we made sure to kind of separate or um, I guess divide the emissions on the like the, the holding companies level, which is usually reported in the sustainability reports, um, and then divide that um, among the states that it operates in. Um, so for example, First Energy operates in Ohio amongst other states. And so we kind of carved out their emissions that were from its services in Ohio, and then compare that to its RPS target in Ohio. In the case of the historic data we have for utilities, 91% of the targets were achieved. The, the, it's a very small numbers game of what happened to those for whom the target wasn't achieved um, at the moment. So what you see here is just a kind of, you know, uh, Alicia's done the more complex modeling that we'll go back to in a moment. This is just kind of the quick look at the data as we've compiled it. And you see, we just have two targets, um, National Grid and OG&E &E, that are like purely voluntary where there was no state um, RPS or other mandate associated with it. The rest of our historic data all falls into categories where there is some sort of state law some of which have a financial penalty if you miss it, some of which don't. And so that's what you see here is kind of grouped into those two categories. And then the number of targets each of these utilities had is what's represented in our vertical axis with green being um, the number of targets that they achieved on time and the red being the number of targets they didn't achieve on time. So you can see in, in general, um, you know, the two voluntary ones were set as easy targets most likely and they knew they could hit them and they did. If there was no penalty, 
uh, they were only 81% achieved versus 98% achieved, percent achieved when there uh, was a penalty. So we do see that the penalties appear to be significant. Um, again, it's not as large of a data set as we'd like, uh, just because the while there's a lot of future targets today, there's not as many past targets to, to look at so far. We have this one was looking at whether or not there was any sort of financial compensation uh, tied to the target existing for management. And in this case, historically, it was kind of a wash, um, which, you know, I personally found kind of disappointing uh, and hope that will be different moving forward. But you can see it was basically 91% either way, whether or not there was some sort of financial target there. Um, my anecdotal observation is I think these are getting stronger moving forward. And so as the level of compensation gets stronger, I think there will be they will become more meaningful and hopefully will drive a difference in target achievement, you know, 2020 and moving forward. But historically in the utilities we looked at, it doesn't really show up as meaningful. What is the y axis show here? Uh, so same as a left graph, the number of targets that each of these utilities had. So some of these targets had annual, um, they had it like for every year they established where they wanted to be. And so that's why you see a, a bigger bar on some of these and other ones just had maybe you know, every five years or they had the single target for 2020 that we're looking at. So that's the, the number of targets that they had publicly said, you know, they, they put a milestone out there. This includes the revised targets, let's say it's in one year, then they revised it, say they had a target for 2015, then they revised it, then that counts as a number of targets. Yeah. So yeah, we track both the original targets as well as the revised targets. So you can, maybe you met your revised target, but you missed your original target. And we have both of those in here. The planning level is the other one that Alicia and some other students um, helped her put a lot of time into, you know, as she was explaining around PNM, what kind of how much detail is there there? Can we really see why we think they either are going to achieve or not achieve? And so she's categorized each of these into these different, with each of their targets into different buckets of, you know, level one, as she described before, was there is basically no plan level and two, three, and four all have different levels of planning associated with, you know, transparency around how are we going to get there? Um, and again, historically, it's, you know, there's not a lot of variation here, um, but that may change moving forward. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Alicia. I spent a lot of time uh, expanding the data set as well as figuring out how to code this very unique uh, information into um, the categories and whatnot. And we've also gone through a lot of iterations of different models from different disciplines that could be useful for our um, question. Um, we've kind of settled on the logistic regression model. Um, we are not married to this model, so if you have any suggestions for alternative models or other ways we can uh, use a logit model, um, we do appreciate that feedback. Um, but we decided for now the logistic regression model because it does spit out this binary outcome, uh, whether in the context of our research, whether the utility achieves or does not achieve a target. And on the right-hand side of that equation, we can have all of these variables. And as I mentioned before, we had a mixture of continuous and um, binary variables. And our, uh, the logit model would take that into account and would be, um, could be used on that type of variables. Um, and so far, we used the logit model or repeated measures logit model. Um, in other words, we use a logit model on panel data. Um, so basically each of the targets are its own individual. And with each of the individuals, we have uh, the time series or the snapshots in time. So we have PNM, uh, for example, that was established in 2010 with a target year 2015 as its own individual ID1 and all the data that corresponds with its own time series. And then we did have a second individual PNM, which had a target for 2020, also established in 2010 and all of its data. Um, for that target. So far, we've only run, if you go back, sorry. Um, so far, we've only run the bivariate regression models where we are looking at just one uh, independent variable, one right-hand side variable, and then the target achievements. And we found that the target type, so whether it's binding or non-binding, is significant at the 0.05 level, as well as the target aggressiveness, which is the percent per year or the speed of the target or how much, uh, carbon that you would need to reduce um, within the years. 
Uh, we've also interested in looking at the interaction between these variables. And as you can imagine, um, the variables that we've included on the right-hand side of the model um, are somewhat related to each other. And so we're trying to tease out some of the interactions that might be found there. Uh, one that we've kind of teased out is target aggressiveness and then planned actions. Our intuition is that if we need to reduce more um, carbon very quickly, we would need more aggressive plans, i.e. we would need to um, eliminate or retire our fossil fuel-based generation assets and replace them with renewable or cleaner sources. Um, and so we ran that interaction and we did find also that it was significant at the 0.5 level. And we're still trying to tease out some more of those interactions as well. Um, but as we found with the preliminary analysis, uh, historic emissions is not sufficient for predicting future performance. And that was very much based on our like visual inspection. Um, but we do think that with this logic model, we're beginning to kind of tease out the more quantitative support um, for this um, finding. And then we're also trying to uh, tease out the predictive variables, the significant predictive variables um, for the next uh, model. Um, so what's the next step in this research? Well, again, we're still tinkering with this model. Um, and we're also using, planning on using CDP data, um, which would be useful in a couple of ways. One, that it would expand our model across industries and not only specific to the utility sector, even though having a model um, just for the utility sector does capture some information that would be lost if we had a very general model. Um, this data set will also allow us to include some other variables that we just couldn't find in the integrated resource plans and sustainability reports, such as perceptions of risk and the cost of investments or the cost of um, implementing some of the stated planned actions. All right, with that, we will move to the feedback.